Good evening. I'm Richard Meserve, and I'd like to welcome, welcome you all to the opening lecture in this season's Capital Science Lecture Series. In 1910, Helen Keller wrote, the problems of deafness are deeper and more complex, if not more important, than those of blindness. Deafness is a much worse misfortune, for it means the loss of the most vital stimulus, the sound of the voice that brings language, sets thoughts astir, and keeps us in the intellectual company of man. Helen Keller, deaf and blind since childhood, had encouragement in the rich language of sign to help her reach out and communicate. In the course of history, however, few have been so lucky. In ancient times, the plight of the deaf person was considered hopeless. The Spartans were said to have killed their deaf children. The Romans accorded them no legal rights. Aristotle proclaimed that people could not be educated because without hearing, people could not learn or even think. For centuries, the deaf person was considered a second-class citizen. Hearing impaired people fared better than those with no hearing at all. Ear horns or ear tubes were developed to amplify sound waves. These devices range from large trumpet-like horns to decorative table urns designed to capture sound from any angle in a room. By the early 1900s, electricity began to be employed in the manufacture of hearing aids. And by the 1980s, the cochlear implant was developed by which electrodes implanted in the inner ear directly stimulate nerve cells. Though hearing aids and cochlear implants are effective for some people, they do not restore normal hearing or cure hearing loss. They are, in effect, prosthetic devices. Nothing has been developed that can replace or restore the complex pathways used in the human ear to transmit, transmit the information content in sound to the brain. In recent years, thanks in large part to our guest tonight, there has been remarkable progress toward understanding the biochemical mechanisms behind hearing. Dr. Paul Fuchs and his colleagues at the Johns Hopkins University have studied in great detail how cells in the inner ear release a burst of chemicals when they detect sound waves. These chemicals then stimulate nearby nerves to send signals to the brain. Dr. Fuchs and his colleagues have discovered novel mechanisms by which this process works. Their studies hold promise for dramatic improvements in the range and accuracy of hearing devices. They also might lead to future discovery of drugs to treat hearing loss. We will hear about these advances tonight. Dr. Paul Fuchs is the John E. Bordley Professor at Jobs Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is also a professor of bio biomedical engineering and a professor of neurology. He holds a BS from Reed College and a PhD from Stanford University in neurobiology. Following a NATO fellowship at Cambridge University's physiological laboratory he has spent 11 years as a member of the faculty of the Department of Physiology at the Dep University of Colorado School of Medicine. In 1995, he joined Johns Hopkins. In 2004, Dr. Fuchs was named the Director of Research and John E. Bordley Professor at Hopkins. Two years later, he and his colleagues established the Center for Sensory Biology of the Institute for Basic Biomedical Medical Science of which he is currently the co-director. The Center for Sensory Biology is the first research facility to study the common and unique attributes of all the primary senses, not just hearing, but also vision, touch, taste, and smell. Dr. Fuchs has published more than 60 research papers, reviews, and book chapters. He is the editor of a forthcoming book about the ear to be published as part of the Oxford Library of Psychology he is the past president and a current council member of the Association for Research in Otolaryngology, and he has lectured widely around the world. The National Institute of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders reports that about two of every 1,000 children in the United States 
are born deaf or have a hearing impairment. The Institute also reports that nearly half of Americans over the age of 75 suffer hearing loss. The loss of hearing can be at best an annoying burden and at worst a devastating affliction. We are honored to welcome tonight a scientist who has devoted his life's work to understanding the ear and how it works. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Albert Fuchs. Thank you, Dr. Mazur, for that elegant introduction. I feel like I almost don't have to give my talk now. That was so good. Uh, thanks, too, to the Institute for the invitation to start off the series this year. I think it's a marvelous uh, compliment to this Institute to have this kind of outreach to provide for the world at large, uh, one hopes, clear uh, visions of particular fields of science, and I hope tonight to contribute to that process. And finally, let me thank all of you for turning up this evening to hear me talk a little bit about how the ear hears and sometimes doesn't. And what I'm hoping to do this evening is to provide, as Dr. Meserve so ably said, some ideas about how the ear itself does this incredible process of converting energy in the acoustic world around us into these percepts that tell us about the origins of those sounds and what they mean. Now, to motivate the lecture a little further, what I thought I'd do is begin with a couple of strange but true facts about the ear, the auditory periphery. And one is that the inner ear produces sounds. So this is an organ which is designed to hear sound, receive sound, but it itself can also produce sound. And we'll see what that means later in the lecture. And furthermore, not only does the ear talk to the brain, but the brain talks back to the ear, and in doing so, in fact, turns the ear off. So in a very real way, the central nervous system, the brain, can deafen the ear, and will, again, I hope, see the sense of that as I go forward. I also wanted to say that that's the last sort of gratuitous PowerPoint graphics I'm going to use this evening. So. <laughs> the, others, the others are going to be completely necessary. So the actual lecture plan is shown here. I'm going to say a little bit about the, the, about sound, some of the properties of sound as they relate to our u utilization of it. And most importantly, of course, is the frequency composition of sound so that there's a pattern of frequency, intensity, and timing which gives us the meaning of these acoustic objects. And then how that is done by the cochlea will co constitute a major part of what I'm going to talk about this evening. But that leads us then to talk about the cells within the inner ear, which actually have the job of turning energy in the form of sound waves into electrical signals, bioelectrical signals, which are used by the nervous system to process information. And finally, that leads us to talk then about how there are connections from the ear to the brain by nerve cells, and then also back from the brain to the ear, also by nerve cells. So how do we analyze sounds? Well, we look at the frequency composition of those things. And I'm going to demonstrate this by using a little instrument called a spectrograph. So hopefully I can get this to work by moving things around on my computer here. Uh, down here, right. OK, so what this is is an instrument which can, oh, if I keep it on, which can take sound and convert it into a visual image. So what's going to be happening on the bottom is that there's going to be a time base. Let me get that running. OK. So now this is a spectrograph, which is basically connected to the little microphone that's inside my notebook computer here. So when sound goes into that microphone, it's going to be displayed on this spectrograph as a function of time running across the bottom and then frequency on the y-axis. So the green record up here is just the intensity of sound, and it's picking up my voice as I'm talking. And down here, we see it's being broken up into its frequency bands so that we can look at sound as a combination of timing, the way these bands occur in time, and then frequency composition, where down here at the very bottom of this axis would be about 20 cycles per second then I believe this is 1,000 cycles per second, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the very top is 8,000 cycles per second or eight kilohertz. 
So you can see that as I speak, there's all kinds of strange and wonderful patterns going on here, a little bit difficult to appreciate right off the top. So let me see if I can pucker up well enough to whistle into the microphone and give you more or less a pure tone. Okay, so that's about two kilohertz, I think. So there you see a pure tone gives us some energy at two kilohertz, which lasts for the duration of time that I was whistling. If I do something a little more complicated. So there's what's called a glide or a frequency sweep. So you see that the sound goes from lower to higher frequencies. And, you know, I can do this a long time, so I better stop and move on with the lecture. But basically the idea that you can see is that there are different frequency components. We can visualize them with a spectrograph. So let me go forward, jump back to the slideshow. And that's going to happen here, I hope. Yes. And sorry, I'm working with a notebook, which the screen actually only shows me about a quarter of what you can see up here, so it's a little odd. All right, so to move along then, here's a spectrogram which is of some real speech. That is to say, this sentence, the spectrogram, I can see you. So again, as a function of time along the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis with more or less the same axes that we were just looking at in the live uh, spectrograph. And the point that I want to make in particular is that speech consists of very complex patterns of frequencies and timing. And in particular, I want to point out that the consonants, the so-called frictive elements of speech, are especially rich in high frequency components. So the S of C, as you see here, is basically constrained to the range between 4 and uh, 5 kilohertz. And there's very little to no low frequency energy here. So in order to be able to tell that this is a s versus a t or a p, we have to be able to hear these high frequency sounds, higher frequency sounds. And so this is very relevant to the process of hearing loss because it, in most cases, as hearing gets lost, it tends to occur from the high frequencies first and then gradually progresses to lower frequencies. So age-related hearing loss is the loss typically of higher frequency hearing we're going to see why that is the case to some extent later. But what that means then is it becomes very hard to understand the consonants in speech. And those, of course, go a long way toward determining whether this is the word C or me or P, for instance. OK, so where does this all happen? It happens inside the inner ear. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the pathway that leads to the inner ear. This is a, a lovely illustration from Max Brodel, who came to Hopkins from Austria in the mid early 1930s. Uh, there's many beautiful medical illustrations there in the collection of medicine as art. The originals are still there. So this is quite a, one of those nice drawings. But a little more useful for tonight's purpose is to look at a somewhat simpler drawing that's in color. And this is um, one of many figures I'm going to show this evening from a wonderful website called Promenade Round the Cochlea, which is uh, put together by Remy Pujol and his colleagues at the University of Montpellier. All right, so here we have the external ear, the bit that we can see on the outside of the head, the ear canal. That leads to the middle ear cavity in which one finds the middle ear ossicles. And then that leads on to the sensory organelle of the, co of the auditory end organ, the cochlea. Equally within this uh, bony space, within the temporal bone, are the vestibular organelles, the semicircular canals, and the so-called otolith organs, which enable us to detect the position of our head in space and its motions about the three axes of space. So let's first talk about the middle ear, because this is a very important part of the process. And the middle ear ossicles are a uniquely mammalian invention. It turns out that reptiles and birds and other vertebrates don't have three middle ear bones. They just have one. We mammals decided that it would be better to have three. And it has to do with having better sensitivity to higher frequency sounds, as it turns out. But for now, let me just make the point that what's going on here is that the middle ear ossicles enable us to overcome a rather serious problem, which is that the sensory organelle that we're going to look at in a moment is inside the cochlear duct in water. It's underwater in particular, whereas sound waves propagate through air, which is a gaseous medium. So the compressibility of air is very different than the compressibility of water, and the energy transfer between those two media is exceedingly poor.
you know well that if you're underwater in the swimming pool and your mother calls to you from out or your mother calling to your kids, you can't hear that voice because the energy just bounces off the surface of the water. There's about a 95 to 97 percent energy loss at that interface. So if we didn't have the middle ear ossicles here, we would be suffering a very much less sensitive hearing. But instead, we have the eardrum, which is uh, this sur um, surface here, which collects energy over a large area and then transmits it through the ossicles to the smaller area of what's called the stapes footplate. So there's about a 20-fold area gain here, area ratio, so that the pressure is collected here and, in a sense, amplified onto a smaller area here. In addition, there's this uh, lever action of the middle ear ossicles, which also helps to overcome what's called this acoustic impedance mismatch. So with the middle ear intact, then, we have nice sensitive hearing. We can overcome the problem of getting sound from air into water. And it also allows me to point out some of the kinds of hearing loss that are uh, typically diagnosed. And if you ever go to the ear doctor, he will, to complain of a hearing loss, one of the first things that he or she will do is to, tr is to determine whether you have a conductive hearing loss or a sensory neural hearing loss. A conductive hearing loss means that the middle ear just doesn't work as well as it should do. So the sound's not conducting into the cochlea, into the inner ear. This kind of hearing loss is, is quite correctable. Uh, amplification is very effective, but actually, usually, uh, there's all sorts of other things that can be done, including surgical approaches to restore mobility of the middle ear ossicles, which sometimes get scarified after prolonged infective processes. So anyway, conductive hearing loss is something that can be rel relatively quickly treated and well treated. But on the other hand, sensory neural loss is a much more severe kind of problem, because here, the cells that I'm going to tell you about in a little while, are the sensory receptor cells, the hair cells, actually get damaged and die. And unfortunately, they're not regenerated. So in mammals, the receptive cells of the inner ear are born once, latent embryogenesis, and they live throughout the lifetime of the organism unless something kills them off, and then they're gone forever. So hearing loss of the sensory neural class is permanent. It's much more difficult to overcome. You can amplify with standard hearing aids. But ultimately, if there's very profound hearing loss, then a cochlear implant has to be used. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, that in a little, little later. One last point I want to make about the middle ear is that although it itself, the middle ear ossicles, are ideally suited for transmitting sound into the inner ear, nonetheless, it is also possible to get sound into the inner ear through bone conduction alone. And in fact, there's a form of a hearing aid called the bone anchored hearing aid, or Baja, which has a titanium plug inserted into the skull bone. And then sound is used to vibrate the outside of that plug. And that form of transmission is actually fairly effective. And one can get reasonable amounts of uh, signal into the inner ear by, in fact, using a bone implant like this. So in some cases, this turns out that the Baja is a preferred means of amplification over the standard in the ear canal hearing aid. OK, so now moving along, we have the middle ear providing a motion which actually sets up a fluid movement within the inner ear. So this is called the cochlea, after the Greek word for a snail shell. And it's spiraled like a snail shell. And it's a fluid-filled cavity. There are two main chambers separated by this thick membrane that's drawn in a darker blue color here. The sensory hair cells and their associated neurons sit on this blue membrane. And we're going to talk about that in much more detail. For the moment, though, what I want to point out is a really remarkable feature of this structure, and that is that depending upon the frequency at which the stapes footplate is moving, there will be a deflection of this central membrane that is at different positions as a function of that frequency. So high frequency sounds cause maximal vibration of the central membrane at this end of the cochlea, which is called the cochlear base. But then progressively lower frequency sounds propagate along the membrane to progressively more apical locations. So that there is, in essence, a kind of tuned vibrator moving along the length of the cochlea with different frequencies setting up maximum motions at different positions along the duct. That's shown here more quantitatively with the silhouette of the cochlear membranes from the human inner ear drawn. And the frequency range of human hearing is charted on here. 
So as young adults, we can hear up to about 20,000 cycles per second, 20 kilohertz, and that vibrates the basilar membrane or the cochlear membranes very close to the input point of the stapes foot plate, that middle ear ossicle. Then as the sound frequency drops to lower and lower levels, the position of maximal vibration propagates along and arrives at further apical locations, all the way down to about 20 cycles per second, or 20 hertz, which is the low frequency end of the human hearing range. That pattern of vibration has a particular shape. It's called the traveling wave, and it was first described by Georg von Bekeschi, who received the Nobel Prize for that work. And so you see here several of these traveling waves propagating along the length of the basilar membrane. This is shown more nicely here in a computer simulation which was made by Hiroshi Wada at Tohoku University. And this is as though we've taken the basilar membrane, this cochlear membrane, out of the cochlea and unrolled it. So you sort of blow it straight. And now look at the pattern of vibration as it occurs for two different pure tones. And we can see an important thing, and that is that the vibration travels along, as I mentioned, somewhat like a water wave, reaching a peak at a point which corresponds to a location specific for that particular frequency. So two kilohertz sets up a maximal peak of vibration here near the apex of the cochlea, but six kilohertz, a higher frequency, actually sets up a peak here near the middle of the cochlea. And the reason for this is because the shape and mechanical characteristics of this membrane vary systematically from end to end. You can see that it's somewhat narrower here and wider here. If the other dimension was drawn on here, it would actually also be a bit thicker at this end, at the basal end, and thinner at this end. So this membrane is very stiff at the basal end, so it responds best to high frequency motions. And it's much floppier at the apical end, so it responds best to low frequency stimulation. So this idea about a frequency-dependent motion within the cochlea is the very essence of how the inner ear resolves the frequency components of sound. We have a structure which vibrates in a frequency-dependent manner, and now I'm going to tell you about uh, the mechanosensors which sit on that membrane, which are called hair cells. For now, let's just take it as a fact that there are mechanosensors distributed all along the length of this membrane, and they are connected by wires, or in other words, neurons, which carry that information up to the brain. So by this kind of arrangement, we now have the labeled line that is a population of wires or nerve cells which represent different frequencies in the environment because a mechanosensor at this position will be maximally stimulated by a high frequency sound and then successively lower frequencies will activate mechanosensors further along the cochlear duct. This pattern of labeled lines, a population of neurons which reports on stimulation in the sensory periphery, is analogous to the way that the brain organizes all kinds of sensory input. So for instance, we know that visual information reaches the back end of the cortex here as a pattern of the retina. That is, there's a retinotopic map in the back of the brain which reports on visual stimuli in the world outside by that kind of mapping process. Similarly, you may have seen pictures of the so-called homunculus on the surface of the brain, this kind of distorted picture of the body surface, which is a map of the, the limbs and the trunk and the other portions of the body for the sensations of touch and other uh, tactile senses mapped here on this portion of the uh, co cortical surface. And then if we look carefully down here in this little crevice, it turns out that the auditory information, the nerve cells from the cochlea, through a succession of relays in the lower levels of the nervous system, project up to their part of the brain just like the other senses do. And so here within this little region of the temporal gyrus, we find that there's a frequency map which results from this pattern of labeled lines in the auditory periphery. And so here in the brain, we have a little piano keyboard, if you will, which reports on different frequencies, but really it's reporting on a part of the body surface in just the same way that somatic sensation and visual sensations are mapped in the cortex. Now, there's a very important consequence to this idea of frequency-specific stimulation in the inner ear, and it is, lies, at, again, at the, as the basis for the therapeutic device or the prosthetic device called the cochlear implant. 
What's shown here is a picture of a cochlear implant inserted into the cochlea where there's pairs of electrodes running along the cochlear spiral. Let me go to another demonstration if I can. And this is a demonstration of a cochlear implant provided by Cochlear Corporation, one of the companies that makes these devices. And what we see here is an insertion into the cochlea. So under conditions where the hair cells have died, remember I said that they, are, they can die and are not regenerated, nonetheless the nerve fibers very often remain. So those nerve fibers can be shocked electrically and cause to fire, their, to send off their signals. So if you can bring electrodes into the ear, into the inner ear, and shock those nerves in a frequency-specific way, then you ought to be able to produce a kind of mimicry of the way the cochlea ordinarily works. And so this device has electrode pairs strung along, and as you see here by these little bands, and they represent different frequencies of stimulation. These ones then will have high frequency uh, signals coded onto it, and then middle frequencies, lower frequencies, and the lowest frequencies going around. Now this is actually picking up my voice as I'm speaking, but the sensitivity is turned way down. So what I'm going to do is play a recording and uh, get it to show you what it looks like when a particular word might be spoken. Asa, asa, asa. So this asa. syllable, a set of syllables, asa, asa, asa is mostly low frequencies, asa. those sort of vowel sounds asa. which have low frequency content. Asa. There is a frictive in there, an S, but it's very brief and relatively low intensity, so we don't really see it. So this is mostly a low frequency signal. If we now compare that to stimulation by a different word, here we can see that the frictives at the beginning light up these higher frequency electrodes, and the low frequency electrodes in the vowel sounds are still stimulating down here. Choice. Choice. So let me turn that off Choice. and go back to our slideshow. So the cochlear implant is taking advantage of this kind of frequency map within the inner ear, shocking it electrically in a manner that I, says, that I said mimics the way the hair cells would have worked if they were still there. Now the cochlear implant has been an, an enormous boon in restoring hearing in many circumstances. And it's a subject which is continuing, it's a, a device which is continuing to improve all the time with additional technical advances. And also very importantly with understanding how best to implement it. So for instance, there's now ongoing outcome studies by my colleague Dr. Naparco at Johns Hopkins where they're looking at the utilization of cochlear implants by increasingly younger children. Of course, you know that we learn speech as young children. In fact, there's good evidence that there's something called a critical period for the acquisition of speech. And so it seems sensible that it might be better to give cochlear implants to increasingly younger children who are born deaf in order to enable them to use that information to gain um, uh, language skills and to enter school at an age-appropriate level. One always talks about the star patients in these sorts of um, discussions, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this little girl whose name is Yuki. I met her when I was lecturing in Japan this summer in Kyoto, and Yuki was there to demonstrate her cochlear implant, which she received when she was uh, just a little over five years old. So she was deaf from birth, and unlike what I just said, that it's good to get these implants early in, in life, Yuki has done a remarkable job of learning to use her implant after a, a period of only eight months. So she came into the lecture hall where we were teaching and she read to us from her storybook in Japanese, so I can't tell you how perfect the pronunciation was uh, or what it meant, but uh, what was striking was the quality of her voice, which was well inflected, she had good uh, intensity control, there was prosody, there was rhythm, and, and kind of uh, the musicality of speech was there, which I find to be really quite extraordinary considering that she has, this, has had this for such a short time. Now she's obviously one of these star patients, and there are a few of those around. Uh, typically though, the utilization of the cochlear implant depends on many factors, uh, some of them to do with the age at which it's a, a, a acquired, some of them to do with the form of deafness, etc but it is obviously a place where the future still lies ahead in terms of how much the brain can learn to do with the relatively limited kind of input that the cochlear implant provides.
So I've told you about really one central idea for the lecture this evening, and that is that we are able to capture the frequency contents of sound because we have this frequency-specific vibrator in the auditory periphery, the uh, varying mechanical properties of the cochlear membranes which confer this kind of tuning. Now that is a necessary component to how the ear hears, but it's not entirely sufficient. And the reason it's not sufficient is because if you just look at those membranes and work out how they should vibrate for a given tone, then the physics of this situation tells us that they should vibrate with a pattern like this, a relatively low amplitude motion that's relatively broad in shape. That's the physics. This is the biology. So this is how the cochlear membranes, in fact, do vibrate in a living cochlea. And so there's a much greater amplitude here, almost a thousand-fold larger uh, response. And it's much more sharply tuned, much more frequency selective. This is the live, biologically active cochlea. And I'm going to tell you later that this arises because the sensory hair cells within the inner ear not only detect sound, and generate an electrical signal in response to sound, but they actually generate movements. And it's those movements which amplify the cochlear vibration pattern and confer upon it the sensitivity and frequency selectivity which gives us our normal hearing. Well, so let's figure out how that happens by looking more closely into the inner ear. This is the cochlea of a guinea pig, and it's been dissected open so that you can see the membranes. They've been stained with a dye. And in fact, they've then been prepared for another way of looking, which is with an electron microscope. And so we're looking down onto the cochlear membranes here. And what we can see is that there's some interesting structure. In fact, there's these little rows of white things that look maybe like fence posts. And there's three rows here on the outer margins of the turn, and then a single row of fence posts here on the inner margin of the turn. If we go to a higher, higher magnification, we can see that these fence posts are actually the hairs on top of the sensory hair cells. And there are three rows of outer hair cells in the cochlea, in the mammalian cochlea, and a single row of inner hair cells. If we look at these patterns of hairs more closely, so we look at just one set of hairs from an inner hair cell here and an outer hair cell here, we can see that they have a very uh, characteristic structure. They occur in rows, as you see here, and of graded height, from short ones to, middle, to middling height ones to the tallest ones here. So this is the inner hair cell, where they are more or less in straight rows. This is the outer hair cell, where the rows of hairs form something like a V or sometimes a W shape. One other feature that I'd like to point out is that if we look very closely at the tops of these hairs, we see these little filaments connecting the top of one hair to the side of the next taller hair. And these so-called tip links are, turn out to be quite important for the process by which a hair cell can turn a mechanical stimulus, mechanical energy, into an electrical signal. So we're going to look at more detail of how this cochlear membrane and the hair cells and supporting cells on top of it actually move when sound comes into the cochlea. So here's a nice animation which shows this uh, sensory epithelium. So here's the cochlear membrane we've been looking at up till now. And riding on it are the hair cells and the sensory supporting cells. Now what's not been seen up till now is the fact that there's another membrane here. This is actually an acellular gelatinous sheet. It's called the tectorial membrane. And it lies in contact with the hairs on top of the hair cells. So when the cochlea is stimulated to move up and down, which it's supposed to be doing continuously here, but somebody's getting tired, um, the pattern of motion is such that there's a differential shearing, lateral shear between the underlying cochlea and this tectorial membrane, which pushes the hairs from side to side. And it's that lateral deflection of the hairs on top of the hair cells, which is crucial to their ability to generate an electrical signal. Here's another picture of how that happens. My colleague Keith Duncan at the University of Michigan provided this nice little video where he has a single hair cell here. This is the bundle of hairs, which you don't see as individual hair cell, but rather as a kind of uh, group of hairs. But he's pushing it back and forth with 
this water jet stimulus that's diagrammed here. And you can see that this structure is relatively stiff, so it actually rotates as a bundle of rigid rods pivoting about its base. And the consequence of that is that these little tip links up here at the tops of the hairs actually are going to undergo stretch as this bundle of rods is pushed back and forth. So here in the right-hand side is a cartoon, which I'm going to show you an animation of in a moment that will make it more obvious. This is supposed to represent the tip link. It connects the top of one hair to the side of a taller hair. When this structure gets pushed from side to side, you can imagine that going to the right is going to stretch this link a little bit, and going to the left is going to compress it a little bit. That has the effect of pulling on this structure, which is intended to be the gate or the stopper in an aqueous pore, a hole in the membrane of the hair cell, that when that pore is open, water can flow into the hair cell, but also charged particles in the form of ions. So when this structure pushes to the right, this little stopper or gate gets opened, charged particles move in. When this structure pushes to the left, the gate closes. There's a like spring-like element here which pulls it closed, and then that flow of ions stops. So here's the animation, which I hope makes this a little clearer. And that is that with the motion of the hair bundle from side to side, the tip links get stretched. That causes the little stoppers or gates in these ion channels to open. These are aqueous pores that allow the flux of charged particles. In the cochlea, these are in the form of potassium ions. They enter the cell, and when they get into the cell, they change its membrane potential. So the flux of charged particles is a current. In this case, the charged particles are ions, but they behave just like a current. And so the movement of current across the membrane of the hair cell changes the voltage inside the hair cell. So this is the crux of the matter. A mechanical input, that is a motion which pushes these hairs from side to side, is changing the permeability of the membrane in such a way that the voltage across the membrane then changes in a corresponding fashion. So as a sound wave enters the cochlea, pushes all the membranes around, it causes deflection of the hairs from side to side, that produces an equivalent or parallel change in the voltage of the hair cell. So here's one of these hair cells, and this is now just meant to illustrate the following point, which is that as these changes in voltage occur, hair cells, like other cells in the nervous system, communicate with their next partner in the chain through the release of a neurochemical. So a voltage change in this cell gives rise to the release of a neurochemical, in this case an amino acid called glutamate. That then binds to molecular receptors in an associated nerve cell, causing it to be excited. So the whole pattern is mechanical input, hair cell, hair bundle deflection, flux of ions that changes the voltage. The change of voltage causes the release of a chemical. The chemical then changes the excitability of this neuron, which sends signals to the brain. Sounds complicated. It is, but it does work. So here's another picture to make this point again. We're now as though we're standing in the cochlea looking down on the membranes. And remember the rows of, of hair bundles that I pointed to before while well, they're drawn here again. So here's our three rows of outer hair cells. And here's our single row of inner hair cells. Now having said that, giving you this nice picture of how the ear produces an electrical signal and sends it to the brain, I now want to confuse it a little further by pointing out that these nerve cells which take information to the brain actually only contact one kind of hair cell in the cochlea. So these, hair, these neurons, which we call type 1 afferent neurons, contact the inner hair cells in the cochlea. And each single inner hair cell has as its partner 10 to as many as 30 of these afferent neurons. This hair cell also has 10 neurons or more, etc., etc., etc. And the poor little outer hair cells here have very few afferent neurons at all. I'll come back to that in a moment. So what I want to tell you about now is the fact that the ear, and this is the cochlea of from, dissected from the rat's inner ear, which sends information to the brain by way of the pathway that I just described for you, 
This is the afferent limb, which basically excites the brain when a sound occurs in the environment. And then the brain talks back to the ear by an efferent limb. So these are nerve cells that send their information back out to the cochlea. And this signal is negative. It's negative feedback from the brain, which turns the cochlea off. So here's another view of the cross-section of the cochlea, which allows us to look at this pattern of innervation in a little bit more detail. So here's our inner hair cell. It has, I've only drawn in one of the afferent neurons here, but there should be 10 or more. And this is the, the limb that sends information to the brain. Now, 95% of these neurons that make up the great majority of the cochlear nerve have their contacts with inner hair cells. So basically, everything we know about the acoustic world is being captured and communicated by this single row of inner hair cells. Well, this seems like, seems like an enormous waste because we have three rows of outer hair cells, which apparently aren't sending much, if anything, to the brain because they have only a very trivial uh, level of afferent innervation. But instead, these outer hair cells turn out to be the targets for the feedback from the brain. These efferent neurons in red send their processes out to the cochlea where they make contacts onto not the inner hair cells, but the outer hair cells. So the brain can turn the cochlea off, and yet it's talking to the wrong hair cells here. How does this work? And so this picture has been known for more than 50 years and was one of those things that scientists puzzled over for a very long time. And the answer to how this works comes from the fact that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, that the ear is capable of producing sound, and it does so because these outer hair cells are not simply receivers for sound, but they actively respond to sound by generating motions of their own. So let's see what that means. So let me remind you what I said, that the vibration pattern of the, basilar, of the cochlear membranes in physical terms is relatively poor. It has a low amplitude and a broad shape, but the biologically active cochlea has a much uh, larger amplitude motion and much more sharply frequency selective. And this enhancement of the sensitivity and tuning results from the active contribution of these outer hair cells which can move in response to sound. So here's a cartoon which illustrates this point. Like the inner hair cells, the outer hair cells have hair bundles. We've seen the picture. When the hair bundle is deflected, there's a flux of ions across the surface, which changes the voltage of the outer hair cell. So in that sense, they're a, they are a receiver, just like any other hair cell. But then they do something quite different. When their membrane potential changes, they actually undergo a shape change. When they get positive inside, they get shorter. When they get negative inside, they get longer. The consequence of this for cochlear vibration is shown again in this animation, which I'm going to now show at a slightly higher gain here. Now, this is not actually to scale, because what one has to recognize is that the motions here are at a submolecular level at the threshold of hearing, where these amplification mechanisms have their largest effect. So everything's out of scale, but nonetheless, the idea is essentially correct. And that is that when a sound wave comes in and pushes these membranes around and up and down, the deflection of hair bundles that causes a voltage change in the outer hair cells makes them contract. And so their contraction further deflects the cochlear membranes. They amplify the motion by having this active contractility. So the outer hair cells, through this active movement in response to sound, confer onto the cochlea its real sensitivity. This enormous hundred to thousand fold increase in sensitivity and much sharper frequency selectivity. If the outer hair cells are eliminated by a disease process, one becomes deaf. And the brain feeds back to the cochlea to regulate the sensitivity of the cochlea by synapsing onto the outer hair cells. So these little red neurons that I've been drawing in can actually interrupt <clears throat> this process of, of motion in the outer hair cells. I'll come back to that in a moment. First, let me just demonstrate that this is a real phenomenon. So, so far, I've shown you just drawings and cartoons. Uh, 
And what I want to do now is share with you a lovely little video that my colleague Jonathan Ashmore produced. He took, out, he took hair cells, outer hair cells, from a guinea pig cochlea and put them into a dish. So this is one outer hair cell. You can't see the hair bundle up here, but it's there. And to it, he attaches an electrode through which he's going to pass an electrical signal, which in a way is going to mimic sound. Actually, it's going to be exactly like sound, as you'll see in a moment. And so that's going to see whether the outer hair cell, in fact, does change its shape somehow when it's stimulated by sound or by an electrical signal. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, so six, if you seven, see there, it's kind of doing a little belly thing. And the shoulders are going up and down. We're going to rock around the clock tonight. Put me back, back, go. You can never stand still for this part. So it's really moving. It's getting a little tired now. And it's done. So my thanks to Jonathan. He's a wonderful colleague who is the Bernard Cass Professor of Physiology and the Blaise Pascal Professor at the University of Paris. And also the BBC who cooperated in making that video. So outer hair cells really can dance. And the fact that they dance is very useful, one, because it makes the cochlea as sensitive as it really is, and two, because it turns out to be a very useful experimental and diagnostic tool for the operation of the cochlea. So I mentioned at the beginning that the ear produces sounds. It produces sounds because something in the ear moves. The thing that moves are the outer hair cells. And so they act as little mechanical amplifiers within the inner ear. Now, just like any other amplifier, if you turn the gain up too high, it starts to ring or oscillate. And in fact, that happens quite often in our ears. So if we were to now, tonight, go around the audience and put a sensitive microphone in everyone's external ear canal, we'd probably pick up ear sounds, otoacoustic emissions, in the ears of maybe a quarter of the audience tonight. It depends on the average age, which I guess is somewhat older than this patient. These are very common in newborns. So spontaneous otoacoustic emissions very commonly occur in the ears of infants. And this is a normal feature of a healthy cochlea. These outer hair cells are in there. They're tuned up. They're full of energy. And sometimes they just spontaneously start contracting. And as a consequence, the ear produces sounds. So here's a spectrograph, just like ones that I showed you earlier where the ear of an infant is producing an almost pure sine wave at about four kilohertz. Here's the energy diagram for that, spec for that signal. So most of the energy is at four kilohertz. There's a little bit at these harmonics on the sides. So in the clinic, a sensitive microphone is used to see whether there are otoacoustic emissions in the infant's ear. You don't have to ask it a question or have it respond in speech. This is a normal process of the ear, and it helps the physician to determine whether or not the cochlea is healthy. And as I said, this can also be used to, uh, in uh, other circumstances. So these can be evoked, not, they're not only spontaneous, but also can be evoked basically by putting some sounds into the ear and generating what amounts to an echo due to the activity of the outer hair cells. And those stimulus-evoked otoacoustic emissions, again, can be used as a diagnostic tool, but also, very importantly, as an experimental tool. So I've made the point, then, that we have ear sounds because outer hair cells vibrate, and equally because uh, I've made the point that the brain now can regulate the sensitivity of the cochlea by feeding back and suppressing the activity of these outer hair cells. So it makes sense if you've got an amplifier and you don't want it to be too loud, you just turn down the gain a little bit, and that's what the brain does by sending these neurons out to contact the outer hair cells. Now, in my laboratory, this is the topic, one of the topics that we study, which is how does this work in detail? What kind of neurochemical is released here? What kind of molecular receptors are involved? And what sort of uh, information might this help us to provide for thinking about this as a potential therapeutic target for a kind of neuropharmacology of the inner ear. Well, thanks to the work of a very excellent colleague in Buenos Aires, Belen El Goshen, we know what the con constituents of this molecular receptor are. We know that the efferent neurons release a chemical called acetylcholine. 
and it binds to a set of proteins which have the exciting names of alpha-9 and alpha-10. These are members of, of a gene family which are unique. They really seem only to be expressed in the ear, or at least to have a functional role in the ear. And they have very unusual pharmacology. So we think it's quite likely that it'll be possible to generate drugs which act on these receptors and alter the activity of the ear in a way which is highly specific to the ear and won't affect these recept the related receptors elsewhere in the nervous system because they have different pharmacology. So what use is the efferent system? Well, there's lots of things it can help us to do. For instance, in a very loud background set setting, it can help us to quiet that background noise by turning down the gain of the ear. In fact, because these efferent neurons innervate the cochlea in a frequency-specific manner, you can turn down low-frequency noise or high-frequency noise or middle-frequency noise selectively. Additionally, if you're in a very loud environment, the very sensitive ear would be saturated. This mechanism only has a certain dynamic range, so if everything's too loud, you might not any longer be able to discriminate changes in intensity. But if you inhibit the ear a little bit, turn down the gain, then you can restore the dynamic range. And finally, perhaps most importantly for our immediate goals, this feedback mechanism which turns the ear down also serves to protect the ear from acoustic trauma. So you're well aware of the fact that if you're exposed to loud sound environments, this can result in damage to the inner ear. In fact, it damages the sensitive sensory hair cells. If that damage is repetitive and prolonged, eventually the hair cells will die. And we think that we can help to prevent that kind of damage by activating the efferent system. In fact, we know it does do that. And so we're well on our way to defining some specific kinds of small molecules which will act on the efferent system, act on those molecular receptors to either enhance or suppress this efferent feedback mechanism. So I'm going to wrap up by just pointing out then some future goals for our research and that of other laboratories around the world. I've mentioned the fact that we're interested in the sort of pharmacotherapeutics of the inner ear. We've already generated information about the molecular mechanisms that are at work when the brain regulates the ear, so perhaps this will help us to devise small molecules that can perform that role and serve as sort of adjuvant therapy for protection against loud sound under conditions where there's inescapable noise, like on the battlefield or in the workplace or even in the um, uh, recreational setting. There's going to be a continued improvement in cochlear implants. Uh, not only are, is the technology itself going to improve, but I think we're going to see time, times when encouraging the nerve fibers to grow back toward the implant will be a very important uh, improvement in the utilization of cochlear implants. That's a kind of a biological uh, adjunct to that therapy. And finally, I said that hair cells in mammals die and are not replaced. But we mammals are unique in that respect. It turns out that other vertebrates are perfectly capable of regenerating their hair cells. So a bird, when it loses its hair cells, grows new ones, as do reptiles and amphibia. And we're beginning to understand what the differences are in the molecular mechanisms that regulate that process of regeneration. So we hope that it might be possible then to find out what it is that prevents the surviving supporting cells in the mammalian inner ear from becoming new hair cells as they do in a bird, and if we can find out what those mechanisms are and how they differ, perhaps be able to turn that process on again. So let me then just thank my extraordinary colleagues with whom I've worked for such a long time and, and so well, and particularly at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Elizabeth Glowatsky and Hakim Hayal have been working with me there for more than 10 years. In Buenos Aires, I've mentioned Belen Algoshin and her colleagues who are extraordinarily helpful colleagues of mine. And finally, our work has been funded continuously by the National Institutes for Deafness and Other Communication Disorders of the NIH. And thank you again for your very kind attention. Thank you so much. Well, that was a fascinating tour of a, an incredibly complex system. I think that all of us uh, learned a whole lot about a system inside our bodies that we thought we understood before but clearly didn't. Um, we do have an opportunity for a few questions. There are microphones in the aisle, uh, and uh, we'd welcome a few questions. Please. That's the vestibular end organ, by the way. 
I'll repeat the question. Go ahead, I'll repeat the question. So the question has to do with what is the genesis of perfect pitch? Why are some people so able to uh, tune their guitars, which I am terrible at? Uh, and the answer there is that no, there's not a really well understood physiological mechanism. It's not in the auditory periphery. It's nothing to do with the cochlea, almost certainly. It has to do with the central nervous system and just the way those people's cortexes, cortices are organized that confers onto them a permanent representation of particular frequencies. And why that is true, I really have no, and I think no one has a good idea. Sorry. Please. Could you comment briefly on tinnitus? Yes, certainly. So the question is, what's tinnitus, and what can I comment on it? For those of you that have it, as I do to some extent, it's a ringing in the ears. It's very commonly associated with some degree of hearing loss. Uh, it does have a peripheral origin. So probably it does have something to do with the way the cochlea itself works, at least initially. But tinnitus also has a very strong central component. So even in a cochlea, which is completely deaf, the people can still report having tinnitus. And so what we think is happening is that the central pathways, when you have an alteration in the normal input, those central pathways rearrange themselves in some fashion. There's plasticity in the brain that then gives rise to what is an abnormal percept, in a way something like neuropathic pain which arises when, we, when, for instance, there's an amputated limb. And then there's still the perception of pain, even though there's no longer a sensory periphery there. So tinnitus, some people think, is something like that, where the central nervous system has reorganized because it's missing the normal input. Great question. So the question is, is a cochlear implant the only kind of implant? And no, it's not. In fact, people are putting implants directly onto the surface of the head. And the idea is, is that if the cortex is mapped in frequency bands, why not stimulate those frequency bands directly? <clears throat> so that idea is being explored in uh, experimental conditions, not, certainly not in people. And I think it's uh, a much tougher nut to crack because you've got current spread. Tougher nut to crack. You have current spread. <laughs> And you want to stimulate a very selected portion of the, co of the brain. So in an animal model, it requires putting electrodes into the cortex itself, which, you know, that's going to take a while before that gets to the human level. Yeah, in uh, modern cities, you have a, a constant background sound level from the noise of traffic and everything else going on in the city. How does that affect hearing, both your ability to hear now and, and long-term implications for hearing? So what about background noise? We all live now in increasingly noisy environments just outside this building, walking along the streets. Obviously, it's more difficult to hear with a noisy background. One of the things the efferent feedback is supposed to help us with is to try to dampen out that background noise. That only works to a certain extent. And so, in fact, as we lose our hearing, that problem gets worse and worse because we have fewer channels for input as we lose our hair cells. So the Difficulty of background noise is that it obviously makes detecting signals in noise a bigger challenge. We hope that the EFRAN system can assist us in doing that, but it's always a problem. It gets more severe the fewer channels of input you have. If a person is sitting next to two different conversations, you can kind of focus in on one conversation or the other and go back and forth. Is that the parent system turning off one conversation or is it back into how that works? That's a great question. So if you're listening to two voices at once, you can attend to one but not the other. It's probably not so much the efferent system. It may be to some extent, but we know also that we have very good ability to localize sounds in space by comparing the input at the two ears. So central pathways are organized to optimize that comparison. And we know because of its earlier arrival time and greater intensity that a sound source on the left comes to this ear that uh, louder and quicker. So sound localization is used to segregate sources of inputs. <clears throat> now whether the efferent system helps us with that, really no one has been able to determine, but clearly it depends upon that kind of binaural process. If you've only got one hearing ear, uh, 
then it's actually extremely difficult to do that task. And this is why now there's more and more f emphasis being placed on restoring some level of hearing in both ears rather than having a single hearing aid or a single implant to rather have binaural hearing by having both uh, ears able to hear to some extent. Does that mean if I get two conversations going on the same radio, it would be very hard to distinguish between them if they're coming from the same location? I presume the answer is yes, that you couldn't do that with a radio, but I don't in fact know that to be the case. Uh, Tom, Tom Watson, uh, uh, when we were looking for uh, sensory ACEs, once pointed out a, a extreme variability in, in sensitivity in a number of ways of, uh, of people. Could you discuss some of the, the variability uh, among different, uh, different people? In terms of the sensitivity <coughs> of hearing or the frequency range? Take your pick. Okay, so <coughs> sensitivity and frequency range is age dependent, so that's a big part of it. As we age, our ears become less sensitive and our frequency range shrinks. So I can no longer hear uh, some of the sounds that uh, we use to signal to the dogs in our house, although my wife and son still can very well. Uh, so that's part of it. But also I suppose there must be intrinsic differences. We know that there are genetic differences that correspond to differences in the capacity of all parts of the nervous system to operate. And whether there are super listeners in the world because of genetic differences, I presume there are. I really don't know more about it than that. We certainly know that there are poorer listeners in the world because of genetic differences. And one of the big efforts that's taken place in the last 15 to 20 years is to learn more about the molecular mechanisms of hearing by isolating deafness genes in the human population. So going out to parts of the world where there are people that have many, related, many relatives who are deaf and then looking at their genomes in particular to find out what kind of um, mutation has arisen in that family and how does that help us to understand the mechanisms at work there. Okay, our last set of questions here with the people now at the microphone. Please. Um, hi. I really feel about the uh, that the movement of the dead dogs um, sort of determines the, uh, how they absorb the um, ions. So it's sort of like, in a way, selective permeability, right? It's, it's exactly like that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I should have used that, that expression. Yes, that's absolutely right. So hair cells are similar like to every other cell. So at the top of the hair cell, they have selective permeability for potassium ions uh, through that particular pore. But then if you look at the bottom side, around the basal lateral surface of the hair cell, they have uh, aqueous pores for all kinds of different ions. So they've got sodium channels and calcium channels and many other kinds of conductivity pathways, just as do nerve cells, epithelial cells, muscle cells, etc. Excellent question. So the question is, is there actually a difference in the stiffness of the cell membrane itself? And we don't think so. We think the stiffness of those hair bundles is because they're packed full of actin fibrils. So they're basically like little uh, brooms sticking up that are tightly bundled together. And so they bend back and forth like a rigid rod because of the actin. So far as we know, the membrane has the kinds of properties as any lipid bilayer does. Uh, a less technical question. Obviously, the uh, use of headphones with an iPod at high frequency is, is not helpful uh, for hearing loss. Uh, the commercially available headphones with white noise production, do these help or hurt? Uh, I just got some. My wife was very kind <laughs> enough to give me some for airplane trips. Um, I think they can help. Yeah, I haven't really tried mine out that well. It is clearly the case that uh, loud headphone or earphone use can be damaging. I think a simple rule of thumb is that if your kid or someone you know is using an iPod and you can hear it, it's too loud. <laughs> Please. Yeah, that's a great question. So is the cochlear implant sort of has to have to be adjusted, I think might be another way to say it. 
And in, in point of fact, there's something like 20 implants, uh, 20 electrodes in the cochlear device that I showed you. Only a subset of those ever get used. And there's a very extensive training process that goes on after the implant is activated, where the patient works with the audiologist and activates different electrode pairs and tests them with different frequency combinations to find out what part of the cochlea still has enough nerve cells remaining to respond to that stimulus. So there's a really long training process that goes on after activation. And it's different for every single person. Okay. Our last question is over here. Yeah, so the question is, well, since mammals can't grow hair cells, maybe we could take some bird hair cells and put them in there. Uh, that's not a bad question. Uh, actually, people are doing that experiment in a kind of funny way. You can take the bird's inner ear and put it into a culture system and damage the hair cells chemically, and they'll regrow in culture. So what people are doing now is taking hair cells and supporting cells from a mouse and putting them into the chicken's inner ear in a dish to see if they can be tricked into regrowing under those circumstances. So exactly that kind of experiment is being attempted right now, hoping they'll be able to identify the triggers that controls that mechanism. Please join me in thanking Dr. Paul Fuchs for providing an interesting evening. <laughs>